Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Ann Peters from the Pulitzer Center, and I'm glad you're joining us today for our webinar, Teaching Black History to Elementary and Middle School Students. As we wait for more of our audience to join us, please let us know in the chat where you're listening in from. And please also, if you would like to tweet, we are using the hashtag teaching1619. The Pulitzer Center is a nonprofit journalism and education organization based in Washington, DC. Our mission to elevate public engagement with underreported issues through direct support for journalism and through education and outreach programs. We support more than 170 reporting projects each year on global and local issues. On our website at pulitzercenter.org, please take a look under our reporting issues page where we bring together this work by themes, including racial justice, environment, climate change, migration, public health, and more. It is so great to see all of you tuning in from Colorado, Washington State, Oregon, Boston, Bloomington, Indiana, Indiana, Houston, State College, Pennsylvania. The list just goes on and on. So it's just fabulous that we're, you're all here with us today. Our education programming spans elementary schools to graduate degree programs and outreach to the broader public. We believe that by engaging with underreported stories and the journalists who cover them, students will cultivate the critical thinking, communication and analysis skills they will need to inform themselves, cultivate empathy and take action. Our conversation today came about through a project that aligns with our education mission and goals. The 1619 project that commemorates the 400th anniversary of the moment that 20 enslaved Africans arrived on a ship in Point Comfort, Virginia. It examines slavery's legacy by reframing the way we understand this history and by focusing on the contributions of black Americans to the nation. The 1619 project launched with the publication of a special issue of the New York Times Magazine with 18 essays from journalists and historians exploring the lasting impact of slavery on healthcare, the criminal justice and financial systems, city planning and other areas. The magazine also includes 15 creative works and that came out in August, 2019. Also part of the project are five episodes of podcasts and curricular resources for students that Pulitzer Center produce as the Education New York Times partner for the 1619 Project. You'll be able to find those at pulitzercenter.org backslash 1619. Our two newest programs aligned with the 1619 Project are the 1619 Project Law School Initiative, working with Howard University and the University of Miami law students and faculty. This initiative focuses on curricular resources crafted by law school students and their professors to spark frank conversation about the legacy of slavery in legal education. And the aim of this collaborative work is to make the case for an interdisciplinary approach to legal studies that draws upon history, journalism, and public discourse and to create better lawyers in a more just society. We've also launched the 1619 Project Education Network. This network is open to educators, administrators, content specialists, and curriculum supervisors for K-12 schools and school districts. It is also open to educators and administrators who work with adults and youth in jails, prisons, and youth detention facilities. As part of this paid virtual program, a cohort of 40 education prof professionals will receive grants of $5,000 each to support exploration of key issues and key questions of racial justice and other pressing issues. Applications are due Monday, March 15th. And again, you can find out more information on both of these initiatives at pulitzercenter.org backslash 1619. Now a few logistics before we move on. We'll start the conversation with our guests and then we'll have time for Q&A. You'll see a Q&A icon on your screen and please begin adding any questions that you have throughout the remarks. There is also a chat icon on your screen, and that specifically is for any technology issues you might have during our one hour together. Note that all attendees are muted, but if you can't hear us, please let us know via chat. We want to also let you know that we are recording the session to post online for others who could not join us today. And we'll also have a brief survey once our session ends. 
Again, the hashtag for today is teaching1619. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. We are so privileged to be joined by Nicole Hannah-Jones, who first imagined the 1619 Project, who guided its development, and who wrote the project's opening essay, The Idea of America. Hannah-Jones is a staff writer for the New York Times Magazine and won a 2020 Pulitzer Prize for her essay. Nicole will be in conversation with Dr. LeGarrette King. Dr. King is director of the University of Missouri's Carter Center for K-12 Black History Education. His primary research interest examines how Black history is interpreted and taught in schools and society. And please note that the Carter Center's 2021 Teaching Black History Conference will be held online this year, July 23rd through 25th, and will honor the men and women of Tulsa's Black Wall Street, as well as other Black communities that gained an economic independence, along with those who were victimized by racial violence. So thank you both for being with us today. And just to begin the conversation, uh, like Dr. King, I know from your essay in Education Week earlier this year, you began by asking what you called a simple question. Why can't we get Black history education right? Take us through how you go from that simple question to the answer, we can't get Black history education right because we teach about Black history instead of through Black history. So yeah, um, the uh, question is one of, um, is a historic question, right? Um, when we look through history, Black historians, Black teachers, Black educators um, have been telling teachers, telling society how to teach Black history ever since after the Civil War, right? So you had Black educators in the late 1800s who actually developed their own uh, Black history textbooks uh, for their students because they understood kind of this history, right? And fast forward uh, throughout um, time, there's been various different moments when Black educators, right, have said, hey, this is how we teach Black history. But for some reason, we can't get it right. And when I think of all the policies and all the multicultural aspects and culturally relevant aspects, uh, and when they uh, begin to get integrated within schools, what I found is that in many ways, what we're doing is we're teaching about Black history, but we're not teaching through Black history. And we can, um, we can X out history and say people, right? We teach about people, but we don't teach through Black people. And when you teach about something, right, you're telling it from your particular perspective, right? And what we're missing are these Black voices, right? These Black epistemologies, right? these um, Black perspectives that really give us this kind of different historical narrative when we examine history through their eyes, right? So in many ways, I get this question a lot about, well, why is teaching Black history so hard, right? And, and people sometimes may say, well, you know, we have, we have racism, we have slavery, and those things are very hard for us to teach. But then I question, I say, well, the reason why Black history is so hard, particularly for a good majority of the teachers, is because when you teach Black history through Black perspectives, what happens is you have to rethink your whole existence, right? And by that, the history curriculum historically has taught us that white people are so historically important. But when you teach Black history through Black perspectives, what's happened is white people find out that they're not that historically important. And, it, and, and, and it's this identity aspect of we keep on messing up Black history because you keep on trying to infuse whiteness within the Black historical narrative. And because of that, that's why it's so difficult to teach because we, we teach about but we don't teach through. And when we teach through, we will find that, okay, these narratives are a little bit more clearer. Okay, now we understand the humanity of black people. Now we understand how this country, we understand the histories within this history, right? Without just focusing on this notion of history with the singular why. So when we teach about, we're teaching it through a particular perspective and we really need to teach through black people. And that is a true black history. And Nicole, you often talk about your own experience as a student. Um, can you 
take us through a little bit of that too? I know it's it's quite central to a lot of your conversation. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you, and uh, welcome to all the educators on the talk today. And um, thank you the Pul for the Pulitzer Center for hosting this talk. And it just uh, I, I just was reading in the chat that someone has a the 1619 Project Education Network and 1619 Project Education Advocacy Network. And, and considering that my own state is trying to prohibit the teaching of the project, it actually, it, it is a, a tremendous soul um, nourishment to see so many educators committed to uh, teaching this project and supporting other educators in teaching this project. So thank you. Um, so I, uh, I had my first Black Studies class it was an elective class and it was offered in my public high school in Waterloo, Iowa. And I'd, I'd always um, been interested in black history because I, like any human being, wanted to see myself in the story somewhere. So I would really kind of like glom onto the one black character in the book or uh, the one you know, figure we would get during Black History Month. Like I, I remember in middle school, we had to do a project where we dressed up as a historical figure and um, brought in a food from that era. And I was like, I guess I'll be Harriet Tubman because I don't know any other Black women historical figures. So I, I always was searching for myself um, because it is natural to want to see yourself reflected in what is being taught. And, and particularly, I think, when it comes to history, because uh, I, I'm actually working on an essay on this right now for the 1619 uh, Project book. And I'm talking about how you, you kind of assume that if it were important, your teachers would teach it to you. And so if your teachers aren't teaching it to you, it must not have been important. And that is a tremendously degrading experience for students of color uh, to think that the reason you don't appear in your social studies text is because your people really didn't do anything worthy of uh, being taught uh, in, in the history of your country. So when I took this uh, one semester Black Studies class and in three months, uh, we went from ancient Mali all the way up to the 1990s, I, I just was both astounded and, and when I look back at, on it today, even a little embarrassed that I was shocked that there was all of this stuff for us to learn. There were all these books uh, that were written about us and by us. There was all of this history and no one had taught that to me. Um, and so I became both angry and empowered at the same time. I was angry that all these years when, when um, I felt that we just hadn't contributed much of anything, that people had the knowledge that we had and just didn't think it was important enough to teach us. And I was empowered because then I realized oh, there's so much more for me to learn. And I really uh, engaged in a, in a course of self-study and I've been studying it my entire life. I, I studied African-American studies in high school. Uh, if you look on my bookshelf now, that's really all that I read. Um, and so that really was the power to me of both that erasure um, and that discovery. And so many of our kids today still have the same exact experience. They are erased. Uh, and, and I was thinking about something you said, um, Dr. King, when you said that um, you talked about like teaching through people. And what I think is critical is we know that the history we're taught is not about the historical facts. It is about a narrative. And it's not simply saying this is what happened. But it's this narrative that wants to say that we are essentially a good nation. So we are going to teach in a way that confirms this idea that we are a good nation. And because white people are the most important actors in our history, in the way that we're teaching it, then we have to teach in a way that shows that white people are essentially good people. Now, I would argue all people can be good and all people can be bad. And um, there is no such thing as an essentially good nation. Nations do horrible things, nations do great things. And there's not a nation on this earth that doesn't do both of those things. But that's not the role that social studies play. Social studies wants us to have a nationalistic idea of America and that necessarily has to exclude most histories of black people or you have to decenter the actors, right? Like, which is what my essay does, which is says, actually we, we built this democracy. And then that is also taking away from this idea that white people created White people are essentially good who created an exceptional nation. So that was a long answer, but, but there we uh, go. 
No, I think that's 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 a really good point because like while we are like teaching about you know white exceptionalism, right? What the history curriculum, the official history curriculum teaches black people is problems. Yes. Right. You know, problems to be solved. Right. Instead of uh, solutions to our democracy. Right. Holding the country accountable. Right. And it kind of goes back to this notion of you know this identity work and social studies and history education is essentially two things it's about identity and it's about humanity who is human and how we treat people humanely right um and that's what we try to answer within social studies it's not about this notion of patriotism it's not about this notion of uh progress it's not about this notion of it's about getting at the crux of humanity right um trying to figure out well what is the closest story that we can tell about humanity but when we miss on a really good number of people, then that gives us an idea of who we value in our country, right? Yeah, we, we don't get to be, Black people in the way that this history is currently taught don't get to be actors. We are acted upon, right? So some bad white people enslaved us, some good white people freed us, and then we disappear from the narrative until Dr. King's March on Washington, and then he resolves racism with a speech. But we're not actually actors in the story of America. And so even where we are involved, we have no agency. We don't feel like we can take credit for anything. Um, and, and that's just not, one, it's just not true, but we also don't understand. It's not just Black people then who are internalizing these messages. It's everyone else, when the white kids are also like, oh, you guys haven't ever done anything. You guys haven't ever accomplished anything. Why aren't there any black inventors? Why have you never been president, right? The, the, the history we have taught does not explain the society that we're in. And so it actually ends up being damaging um, to every aspect of our multiracial democracy. So how do we, you, you said high school, that was the point at which, how do we get this reframing earlier that's you know we're talking about teaching at the elementary and middle school years but also even earlier when individuals who are going to schools of education are learning and teaching how do we like go to the point to reframe just opening the door for either of you to jump on that one well, uh, um, I can talk a little bit about teacher education, right? Mm-hmm. And I think it's, um, th- there's a lot of research that, you know, states that there's a problem with teacher education, right? There's uh, not these particular classes, teacher education is, is, is not really preparing uh, these teachers to really approach these topics in their classrooms. And, and so it's not just a teacher education problem, it is a university problem. Right, uh, I believe I read some, some, somewhere that only 20% of white students in universities take ethnic studies courses, right? And it stands to reason that with the teacher educators, right, who are predominantly white, that that number is probably less because there's so many hours that they need to, you know, um, take when they're in, you know, teacher education. But, but I know that there are some wonderful teacher education programs that are trying to push the boundaries, but then we, you know, um, we're bound by standards as well, right? Uh, and then, then we have a segment of our teaching population. And I would say this, may not have the capacity yet to realize that these histories or these identities are extremely important in the ways in which we teach. teach. Right, so it's like, oh, tell me how to teach. Right? It's like, well, 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 this is teaching. And what I found is when they come back three, four, five years later for their master's degrees, then they're like, oh, now we're hungry, right? Mm-hmm. We're hungry for this knowledge. We have these experience, you know, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So teach me more, teach me more. Um, but yeah, you know, te- teach your education programs as well as university. Um, universities need to, you know, require aspects of ethnic studies within their, um, um, for all curriculum, um, and some universities are trying, but we, you know, we always re- experience pushback from, um, you know, state bodies and 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 other folk. Yeah, I mean, I I would agree with that. the The problem is is learning this history is always optional, and 
even my class was an elective. You had to choose, elect into the course. And every kid in my class was black, <laughs> even though my high school was 80% white. So that to me is a problem is we, we don't actually think that this is essential. We yeah. think it is additive, it's additional, it's nice if you can do it. Um, what I always say to educators, you can't teach what you don't know. So mm -hmm. you are going to struggle to teach this if you don't know it, but our children can handle it. I, there, I don't think there's a time since my daughter was uh, getting books read to her that she didn't know about slavery. I bought her a book on slavery, a children's book on slavery when she was three years old. We've always talked about these issues. You talk about it differently, clearly as a child. But if we can talk about the Mayflower, we can talk about the white lion and not just what was done to the people on the white lion, but their agency, right? Like I, I'm working on a, a children's book right now that's going to come out in the fall with the adults book. And we talk about William Tucker being the first American child, not the first black child born in America, but the first American child. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are ways, but again, uh, we can't keep treating this as optional. And the 1619 Project is an origin story dealing with uh, African slavery and black people. We need a similar uh, way of teaching indigenous history. We, we, we need similar way of teaching women's history. So you have to, as an educator, um, use the resources that you have to introduce this at a young age. Things are already set in your mind by the time you're in high school. And if you're a black kid, you've already then spent about you know eight years being demeaned and erased from the story of your country. Um, that's far too long. Yeah, I, I think too. Like 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 so. Uh, the reason why a project like sixteen nineteen project was so important is uh, because it got out to the masses, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 so so when it gets out to the masses, so now you know, in addition, right, to, you know, these notions of, you know, these movies and these trade books that come out, you know, teachers can, you know, utilize children's literature, right? Because mm -hmm. most, um, you know, states have squeezed um, elementary social studies so tight mm -hmm. that we'll be lucky to get 25 minutes, right, of social studies in a month, right, uh, in elementary schools. But uh, infusing it within your uh, literacy, um, standards and classes are extremely important. Utilizing the uh, family histories of your, your, your uh, students is extremely important. And not necessarily just the family tree where you put your name and your mom's name and all these other you know, you know, people, but um, you know, really examining, well, if you're from, you know, let's say New York, right? I can just guess that, hey, you probably got some family in South Carolina, right? And then, you know, we can definitely begin to start kind of talking, well, well, wow, well, how did you know that? Well, let's talk, right? So, you know, infusing kind of those micro histories because in early elementary, it's all about the self, right? It's all about the self, it's all about the family, it's all about the community. So if we infuse those family histories within the larger narrative, if we infuse those community histories within the larger narrative, right? You know, the codes from um, Waterloo, Iowa, these black folk had to come somewhere. Right, right from Waterloo out. So, so how do we kind of teach that and tease that um, to um, wet the beak of our students really learning about these complex, you know, histories of, of our country? And overlapping it, and I think there are a number of folks in the chat who are also saying overlapping, not pinpointing it into one class, even, not the, just history or social studies, but as the project um, and the magazine and the podcast, there are very many ways that across the board, the roles and individuals and uh, speaking to history, but through music or through poetry. Um, I know there are a couple of folks in the chat who have said, one person from Virginia said that history standards though also are being redesigned to incorporate black history across the K-12. Um, so I'm not sure at what point that is, is um, perhaps Dr. King, you can see if there, let us know whether you were seeing that as well. I mean, that's again in the history standards and it's segmented, but what are you seeing in terms of teaching black history, but also expanding out as you were pointing out, not, not just segmenting. Well, you, 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 know, um, you know, change within kind of Black history always kind of originates from this notion of social studies, right? So uh, Virginia is kind of going through this whole, um, you know, tearing down the standards, including various different standards. There's various different uh, states out there that have 
what I call Black history mandates. I believe there's around 12 uh, states that have um, Black history mandates. The problem, however, of course, is with policy. When you have a uh, policy without, you know, money is counterfeit, right? So we have to kind of... Mm -hmm kind of push these uh, people to become a little bit more, um, you know, accountable in terms of what we teach in the classrooms. But I do want to caution, uh, particularly for these states, and not to fall into the content gap. I think a lot of times we focus so much on, hey, we have to teach this content, 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 that sometimes we become a little bit overwhelmed um, with all the various different content that people are trying to teach instead of um, really focusing on um, various different themes that I think we need to you know, approach in K-12 education. Yeah, if, if I could just add one quick thing to that. I, I also think that it is critical to teach this as part of American history, mm -hmm. right? Like this, I mean, I'm a black studies major. I, I believe in having an intensive focus, uh, particularly on black studies, but it, that segregation as if um, black history is not just part of mm -hmm. so much of the country that develops, I think is also detrimental because it teaches it that it's separate instead of shaping everything about the country that would come. I mean, that is, that is to me a big part of the popularity of the 1619 project is drawing these connections to all of these things in society that uh, you don't think are related to race or slavery or blackness, but actually have been shaped by this. And that, that is the harder job, I think, for educators, but the necessary job. So to add on to that, uh, Nicole, I think it's too, it's because the curriculum is so Eurocentric. Mm -hmm. The way in which those timelines are set mm -hmm. for those who want to make um, changes and alter the curriculum, sometimes you have to tear mm -hmm. that up. Though, you know, I, 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 I teach that what is historically important to white people may not be historically important to black people, right? So those timelines that we have traditionally, right? They don't match. Right. So as and, and so while we're working with with states and school districts, we have to figure out, well, what is an absolute timeline or not necessarily an absolute timeline, but a, but but a timeline that's a little bit more inclusive, particularly if we're trying to focus on this notion of, you know, um, curriculum integration. Yeah. Like you can't have a slavery unit. That's that's the thing. Like I'm like. Slavery is the first 250 years of our country and it is shaping everything uh, in our country, even in places that don't have slavery. And yet we teach it as a unit for a couple paragraphs. And, and, and that just does not prepare us to really grapple with this institution. And, and we don't necessarily do that with other things. And um, I, 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 I saw a question or a comment pop up in the uh, chat where someone, you know, talked a little bit about resources, and um, and I'm sure we're we're going to get with resources very soon. But but I do want to caution, right? Because I get the the questions like uh, 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 about prepackaged curriculum, right? Mm. Um, without identity work, without changing our mindsets, it doesn't matter what curriculum we get. Mm -hmm our curriculum that we decide to use in our um, schools. If you continue to believe that whiteness is central, you can have the best curriculum possible and still mess it up, right? So identity work is extremely important, professional development on um, notions of who we are, you know, as racialized people are extremely important, even before we even get into kind of the history of curriculum. So while we will share you know, resources, and I know 1619, we're building resources and such, but don't forget about that identity work was extremely important for us um, to explore even before we even get to the curriculum. So when you say identity work, what, what do you mean? Decentering whiteness, right? Um, um, understanding that we're all racialized beings and that our racialization influences the ways in which we see history. Right, um, as you mentioned, history is a mirror, right? Um, so when we look at those history books, we want to um, see people that look like us. And research has shown that um, black students and white students look at history totally different based on our racialized experiences, right? So when we talk about history, and you mentioned this earlier, 
we have to realize that history is not these capital truths or these capital mm -hmm. facts, right? They're a mixture of little T's and little F's, right? You know, trying to create this narrative. So we need to realize that there's histories instead of history and the ways in which we look at and identify notions of our racialized selves, we need to interrogate that even before we even get into those curriculums or, you know, we you can do it simultaneously, right? But, but yeah. And there are a number of both in the chat um, in terms of checking internal bias and examining that in terms of even before you're bringing the, the material to the classroom. And I think there's a hunger among the community here with us today in terms of how they can also check their own biases, how they can, can make sure that, that they're able to teach it from their own, what, regardless of whether they are white or Hispanic or uh, what their backgrounds are. So what advice can you provide? I think people are looking for some, uh, whether it's just things to be thinking about, what they should be questioning themselves as they are teachers at whatever state of the process they are in. Okay. You go, or you <laughs> Just that, there's the question of, there was a one question in terms of white teachers. Uh -huh. And I'll, it was a question of can, how do white teachers in particular make sure that they're checking themselves? Like the people are, are wanting to, to be able to explore this prop, you know, well, across American history. Well, I definitely want to, um, let's not use white teachers as an excuse, okay. right? Because white teachers have been teaching black kids ever since, you know, after the Civil sure. War, uh, even before, right? Um, and there, there has always been, um, good white teachers. And of course, you know, there's always been problematic white teachers, right? I think uh, Gloria Lassen Billings, um, you know, uh, famous book Dream Keepers were about, you know, white teachers who taught, you know, black students. So let's not, you know, use that as an excuse for not um, moving past kind of, you know, equitable practices in, in, in our classrooms. Um, for me, uh, teaching black history is based on several different principles. And I think if we focus on these principles when we begin to start thinking about creating a black history program, uh, I think we will get close to kind of this more humanistic aspect of black history. So principle one, teaching about power, oppression and racism um, is extremely important because those particular concepts still influence black lived realities today. Number two, teaching about black agency, perseverance, and um, you know, resistance. When you focus black history strictly on oppression, sometimes a victim narrative um, kind of portrays, but we have to be very careful because black people have never been solely victims. They've been victimized, but they've never been victims. They fought against these systems of oppression. Principle three, we have to include notions of Africa, the African diaspora, and all the various different migrations that black people have had around the world. Now, this helps us understand blackness as complex and nuanced, right? Uh, particularly when we look at this notion of global. Principle four, we can't just define black history by oppression and liberation. We have to teach about black joy, right? Black joy and black love. And the, the nuance and complex complexity about that is how do you teach black joy without trivializing oppression, right? And I think it's extremely important for us to interrogate that. Principle five, is uh, black identities and intersectionalities. We have to stop focusing simply on black males who are heterosexual, um, middle-class and Christian and focus on the totality of blackness. And um, principle six is probably the most um, controversial uh, because it, 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 it talks about contention. And uh, the, the um, purpose of black history is to try to present this notion of humanity. And Black historical contention kind of focuses on this aspect of sometimes we overcompensate for the lack of Black history and we attempt to make it perfect and pristine, right? Mm -hmm. But the problem is it's not supposed to be perfect and pristine. If we focus Black history simply on perfection, we dehumanize Black people uh, in a way 
that does not really explore their full, you know, humanity. So black people haven't been, you know, uh, pristine and perfect, and they have been, you know, subject to sexism, et cetera, et cetera. You know, some of our uh, most favorite civil rights uh, activists were sexist and homophobic, right? And those are kind of those, you know, you know approaches that that we really need to do. I have two other principles, but I talk too much, so. <laughs> no, you don't. That's that's why you're here. <laughs> the only thing I would add to that is is that I, I think it's important to uh, depersonalize the way that we uh, educators feel about this mm -hmm. history because if if you are personalizing it, then you are feeling the need uh, to paint a picture of white people and whiteness in our in our country that doesn't somehow uh, implicate you. But that is not the role of history. And it is not about you as an individual white person. There's nothing wrong with being a white person or a white teacher. There is something wrong with the way that whiteness has been constructed and how whiteness has been deployed. Um, and that to me is, is, is this need to disconnect those two and not feel like you know, we were, it is a fact, a country founded on slavery and white supremacy. I don't use white supremacy in my writing, but they were explicit. Right, they were explicit back uh, at our founding and really until the 1960s. So that's just a fact. That doesn't say anything about you as a white person today. Um, and teaching that fact and grappling with that, that challenges of our history is what educators are supposed to do. So I, I often, um, I fear like when we have these conversations that so many white educators, um, that they, they personalize what, and, and, mm -hmm. and like, I don't, I, I feel bad. I don't want to feel guilt. If I talk about this, then I'm, I'm implicating myself, but, but, but you aren't, you're only responsible for what you have done yourself. You're not responsible for what uh, the people who you're teaching about did. Um, but your responsibility is to try to teach that as accurately and humanely as possible. Thank you, because again, a lot of, in terms of questions and, and conversations, there's just some powerful information going back and forth in the chat um, in terms of resources um, too for, for um, educators to, to consider um, both in terms of the principles that you've laid out, Dr. King and Nicole, what you have powerfully put forward. So um, there, uh, 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 there are some really smart people in that chat. <laughs> for sure and very thoughtful very much so and and i, I should say I'll, I'll um it would be this video as i mentioned the time together that we have will be um uh, it's recorded and we have this but we can take from some of these very important um conversations in the chat and resources and would be happy to make sure that those are added when we publish this because there's just such um such expertise and interest um, in this conversation. So thank you all for, for sharing. Um, uh, there are, uh, we can turn, I think a couple of questions are coming through. So I think we have about 26 and probably more questions will be coming through in this short time together that we have. Um, I'm gonna pull a couple um, if you think in terms of the question of themes, I think, was one. Um, this is from Deirdre Holman, and she, Dr. King, she mentioned that the importance of teaching themes over content. How themes, what themes do both of you think are important in terms of uh, teaching Black history, teaching 1619? And I'll even take it back in terms of as we're looking specifically at elementary and middle school, um, how to begin those conversations at the early grades on up. Go on, Dr. King, this, this, is, this, is, this is you. Okay. I think for um, the elementary, um, you know, approach, uh, there's, um, you know, children's literature books that explore notions of skin color, right, I, I, I think are um, extremely important uh, for us to begin with. Because here, here, here's the thing, I think a lot of people believe that children don't see race, right? And children do see race, right? Uh, you, you, know, you know, my kids are, you know, young, but, but, but I remember when both of them were in kindergarten, right? They, they would, would say, well, okay, well, you know, so-and-so has brown skin like mine, right? Or so-and-so, you know, 
um, you know, is dark skinned like me or whatever the case may be. So there are questions that these particular, uh, you know, young people have. And I think those books um, you know, can really help us. Um, I, I, I can provide a list later, um, you know, to the group. So um, you all can kind of look through those particular books um, to kind of build your library up. I think another important aspect is always kind of connect the past to the present. Right, I think is extremely important, and 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 this this was the jux I think of the sixteen nineteen project, and helping us understand that these particular issues are systemic and they go through time and space, right? Um, and I think always bringing it back to uh, the individual child, the uh, individual student, in all grade levels, right? With the history, I think is extremely important. But yes, build up your literacy. Um, and, and, and build up your libraries, I think are extremely important, you know, in, in uh, starting. And I mean, uh, I would, con okay. I would <laughs> concur, I would concur. Um, I think I, I just put a, a one of the fa our favorite books, my daughter and mine when she was young, the book called The Colors of Us. And it just has a little girl. I, I, I always imagine uh, she lives in New York who is just talking about all of her friends and uh, the different color skins that they have, right? So uh, I agree, like our kids are coming up in our society. They know, they see it, they know. Uh, I remember having conversations with my daughter who, you know, I'm biracial and, and my daughter's complexion is similar to mine. So she was like, oh, so daddy's black and we're white like grandma. And I'm like, no, we're, we're black too. And she was like, well, why? And then you realize how ridiculous race is when you're trying to explain uh, racial categorization to your child who uh, we're, we're teaching them that race is about skin color, but race is not about skin color. Uh, and then when I try to explain how I could have a black dad and a white mom, but I'm black, <laughs> didn't make sense to her. And you're like, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't actually make sense, right? Uh, which is actually good for adults for us to think about these things that we've settled in our own heads about how race works and how categorization works and what seems natural that it's really not. I think that like key themes for younger kids are, are democracy and really challenging this, these ideas about uh, who how, what democracy is meant in this country and who are democratizing forces. And I also think what's really, really key is resistance. Uh, because I think one of the most demeaning, it, it is not demeaning that we were enslaved. It is demeaning to think that we accepted slavery. And when you teach about resistance, you know, there's a reason we learn about the French Revolution, but not the Haitian Revolution. Yes. These are to teach us certain narratives, right? Um, and I think that those key themes are very critical. And the last thing I'll say quickly is one of the things we're, we're doing for the 1619 Project book is um, with every essay, we're gonna include a photo, a historic photo, not of a, not a famous people, but like regular black people in the late 1800s, the early 1900s, just doing regular human things. Because the way that we teach the story is all of black life was oppression, uh, and torture and struggle. But Black people were just living, right? They were, they were having to deal with all of that. But it's also important for our kids, all of our kids, no matter their race, to know that Black folks are just human beings who just do normal human being things. And you shouldn't have to say that. But that's not the message that we get through the text. And it's not the message we get through popular uh, history that's seen on television. It's just like, every black person wasn't running from the, running from the lynching man, right? Like, and they weren't all picking cotton. Like they were, they were doing normal things. And I think that is really critical for our kids as well. Yeah. And Nicole, the beautiful thing about that, uh, using regular people kind of this, this, this notion of black joy and black love is, 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 is even that can be part of notions of agency and resistance. Absolutely. I think a lot of people believe that there, there's two types of agency, right? There's agency where we're trying to tear the system down. This is where we look at, you know, slave rebellions, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's everyday acts of agency, right? And these types of agency, this, this, this type of agency wasn't necessarily about tearing down the system, but it was about making your lives better underneath the system. And I that's think that's right. extremely important, particularly in this time where we're battling over, well, well, well who's the most woke or, you know, who's the people <laughs> really fighting, but there's severe consequences for, 
you know, uh, the agency about tearing down the system. And Black people throughout history have always used those everyday acts of resistance, right, um, as a way to make their lives better. Even when we think about, you know, enslavement, right, uh, there were times where the enslaved people, you know, pretended they were sick or worked slowed or uh, broke tools, and they ended up getting better, like, you know, you know, have an extra day off or something like that, you right. know, uh, uh, because, you know, of course, those things happen back in the past. Oh, and one thing about our children is we miss out on teaching about um, children as Black history as well. Yes. And that key ties, ties um, you know, the children in within those particular um, narratives. I believe that there's a real good book on the, on, on the Children's March that uh, we use with our daughter and and you know, you know, you know. Oh, those were kids. Kids can make change. Kids are citizens as well, right? And um, those things are extremely important. And Nicole, when you were speaking, it reminded me of the everyday projects where in D.C. we worked with schools. So when you think of D.C., you think of the monuments, the legislature. But what are the the everyday, the nature, the human side, the, to to get that reality to folks? So. Um, Absolutely. There's um, in the chat as well as some of the questions folks have been talking about how they in their own school districts um, have been um, exploring and pushing to bring both the 1619 project um, into their schools, into their curriculum, um, even in terms of pushback uh, you were talking about in Iowa. Um, what um, advice or support can you offer to teachers who are out there attempting to uh, make changes, you know, um, just going on uh, your words of advice, um, what support can you provide to them or ideas for them to, to keep moving forward in terms of trying to get this not only in their schools, but at the school district level and, and going up the chain? I mean, what I have, again, what I'm heartened by is all of the organizing that I'm seeing happening um, in this chat all over the country. One, what we know is educators don't like, it, it, it's actually demeaning to educators to say that we can't trust educators to know how to teach this material or to uh, select which material is appropriate um, and right for their students to teach. Teachers don't like that. Um, and I haven't seen places where teachers have been frightened from teaching this. Uh, I do think it's important though, that type of organizing and realizing there's a small contingent of folks who are trying to prohibit this project. Most people are actually very, very supportive of it. Um, it it's been amazing. My, my middle school social studies teacher, Mr. McCabe, Mr. Denny McCabe, in, uh, who taught me at Hoover Intermediate, has a whole, whole Facebook group of uh, educators that he is organizing to try to repel this law. Um, so I think educators do need to speak up. It, it, to me, it, it's outside of um, the, the, the attempt to censor ideas, which I think should be problematic no matter what you know your politics or what you care about. It also is part of this uh, ongoing effort to deprofessionalize uh, the teaching profession to say that we can't, you know, you guys have gone to school. Uh, you guys are constantly learning to be better teachers. This is not like every person who's had to try to teach their child at home during Corona knows <laughs> this is not something that anybody can just sit down and do. Mm -hmm. And so I do think it's important that you guys speak out about uh, being treated like the professionals that you are and being able to determine what is the proper thing uh, to teach our kids and how. Um, so they're also hoping to, to have some, some additional advice in terms of um, some of the themes and um, Shani Morgan asks, what is the best way to teach black joy and love? And let's keep this in the perspective of elementary and middle school and incorporating that into the, the school day. Hey Shani, um, uh, she, she's up in Canada there, but um, the, um, so like, so, so let's say we are uh, teaching about, uh, you know, enslaved children, right? I think it's a very good project to actually learn about the toys, 
that enslaved children um, created. Right. Because we we will find out that, you know, of course, you know, uh, black folk during that time didn't have money to you know buy toys. But 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 these black children were so um, resilient and so creative that they, you know, created toys and they played with, with those toys. And if you could, you know, mimic and create projects right with your students. Right. And creating these creating similar toys, I think would be um, one example of teaching Black Joy. Uh, teaching Black Joy too could be, so we can take something stereotypical, right? Like the fun foods and festivals approach, right? That most um, you know elementary teachers may go through um, at one point in time in their educational career. And while we're not against that, what we need to do is always contextualize, right? Why, why these particular foods were you know important? Why these particular clothing and where they come from, and what are the historical um, legacy and the heritage of these particular clothes, and um, you know could come from? I think are extremely you know important uh, for us to kind of do um, with Black Joy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one of the things that I think about a lot is um, in my my other book that's way past due on school segregation um, is all of the stories of. Uh, black children in slavery who uh, either tricked their uh, the, the young white kids on the plantations or, you know, to teach them how to read uh, all of the different ways where they would uh, save up some pennies or do extra work so they could buy the blue, the Webster's blue book uh, primer so that they could teach themselves to read. These are all ways, one, to talk about the agency of black children, the agency of black people to combat stereotypes that somehow black folks are the only people in the history of the world who don't value an education. Um, one of the things if in, at the very end of my um, 1619 essay, I talk about all of these uh, kind of cultural things about black America that we treat negatively uh, as stereotypes. But think about if you, if you help kids understand hip hop develops, this, the sampling of records develops because black people couldn't afford instruments and yet wanted to make music. And so it's actually extremely creative uh, to take music that's already been used and, and create something with that. Black nicknames, right? White people named us. So black folks came up with our own, uh, you know, every black person has a nickname. Well, that comes from somewhere. That, that comes from black people saying, you're gonna call us that, but we're going to create our own names that we call each other intimately. You know, black hairstyles, black naming practices, again, something that we often stereotype and so many of our kids who have these unique names, these are truly black American names. They are names that black people created for themselves on this land. Um, so I, I think there's like so many great ways that we could talk about joy and resistance that are also affirming our children's identity and that it's not just about slavery, something that happened a long time ago, but do you know that it was your ancestors' survival that led us to to have nicknames that led us to do our hair this way. There's a reason why um, you know dress is so important in Black communities because they uh, when they came out of slavery, many of them didn't have shoes, so getting shoes was like the sign of progress, right? And so when Black people love Jordan, we don't have to teach that in a way that is negative. We can we can tie that to a legacy, and that what is what I really think is critical in in using this history to affirm the culture of the kids that we're teaching. And I think that's, that's, that's a great example of teaching through Black people, right? Yes. Not teaching about. Because in really, uh, um, in, in, in reality, when we teach about, you know, Black history and Black people, this is what people imagine us to be. And this is what they, they uh, and, and, and I think it's extremely important that whenever um, we situate Black people and Blackness, right, that teaching about is always this notion of, well, we're trying to get you more human. And the ways in which we're trying to get you more human is if you can be just a little bit more like white folk. If you can be just <laughs> like a little bit more white folk, then we're going to respect you as human. Yeah. Right? And then when 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 we do those particular things, and they move the goalposts a little further, you know, you know, out. So, but that that is a prime example of teaching through black people, right? Mm -hmm. Through black history and not about. Mm -hmm. This this has gone by so fast. We only have about <laughs> five minutes or so. I want to uh, pull out one final question from our audience. It's from Katie um, Pierre. I hope I pronounced your name correctly, and I'll paraphrase it. But also, any final thoughts you have as well. Um, she is asking, or she's been teaching 1619 and Black History in middle school. 
Uh, she was wondering how you might advise to deal with the natural, what she calls natural extremes and how middle schoolers think. Um, they were watching um, and discussing the march from Selma to Montgomery and students had a, um, what students took was that seeing nothing changes. So her question is how, as we expose more and more of the leading roles of, of black Americans in history, what advice do you have to also instill empowerment in the mix of anger, you know, as she is talking mm. with her students? Go ahead, Nicole. Uh, so you look like you had a thought on that. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, it's uh, the question is um, weird to me uh, because uh, black students can be angry. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I, it's it's it, I mean if this was done to white folk throughout history you'll be angry too and actually mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of people kind of project a little bit because they know if this history happened to him them they would burn this place down and they have done it several different times more than black folk. <laughs> but anyway I that try to on January sixth uh, you, you know, know I, 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 <laughs> I, so so so. so, so so I say that not to be flip, but just saying it's okay for them to be angry, right? It's 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 okay for black students to be human. Human being angry is a human emotion, um, and you know empowerment is something that I don't think. Um, again, the question is weird because it kind of situates this notion that black kids aren't empowered anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in their home communities, in their home, and, you know, by their parents, by their community, um, you know, communities, their churches, their, their, you know, you know, whatever. So, so I'll be very careful with, with, with the, um, you know, context, but at the end of the day, teach black people like they're human. I think students just want to um, be told or, 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 or help them understand that, you know, black folk are human, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. And I think you'll be okay, but don't worry about, you know, black kids being angry and you know, trying to empower, just teach, just teach. I mean, I what I would add to that is I find my own personal anger to be quite empowering. Mm -hmm. And people, you know, every time I give a talk, folks always wanna like ask me about hope. And I say all the time, my, I'm, I'm not motivated by hope. I'm actually motivated by rage, right? You, you learn this history. You see what uh, your ancestors have been through. And you should be angry, right? There's no, there's no when, when you learn about what happened to Selma and Montgomery, why were we even having to go through that just to have mm -hmm. basic rights to citizenship in the country that we've been in since 1619? That anger is okay. It's, 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 it's how do you respond to the anger? How are you using the anger to teach through? And that anger to me is, do you teach them, okay, so you're angry. Now, how does that anger empower you? What are you going to do with that anger? And to me, I, I funnel my anger into writing, right? So I don't, the, the anger doesn't debilitate me. The anger actually motivates me. And I, I think a lot of times educators are uncomfortable with that anger. Um, but we wouldn't tell Jewish people not to be angry about the Holocaust, right? Like you, you just, you, you wouldn't do that. There's an understanding that when atrocities happen, we should all be upset. We should all be angry about that. And then we decide how do we then use that anger. Um, uh, it is a normal human emotion for our children. And I think that's why we don't teach this history very well because we are so uh, uh, so worried uh, about how students are gonna feel about it. They, they should feel bad. <laughs> we should all feel bad. Some of this stuff was terrible. But at the same time, the story is black people have never given up, right? So no matter what, uh, no matter what they've gone through, black people will still get up and, and keep fighting and uh, save this democracy as recently as uh, 2021. One quick thing, um, you know, this, this reminds me how we teach liberation, right? Like um, for black folk, the civil rights, we always focus on this notion of nonviolence, right? <laughs> um, I've been to history classes all over uh, the country and not one time I ever heard 
uh, a teacher said, wow, do you think the American colonists should have just uh, marched and not threw that tea over the harbor, right? And we celebrate this notion of Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death, right? And we celebrate that, right? Bombs bursting through air. But when it comes to black folk and other non-white folk is always, well, you know, non, non-violence is the most appropriate um, response to, you know, gaining civil liberties. And then you're just sitting up there like, we live in the United States of America. Our country was born off of violence. Right. Yes. So don't sit up here and tell me that violence is not a legitimate form of liberation. Now, I'm not saying that we should teach you know, people to be violent, but I'm just saying don't sit up here because every war that we learn in history class is based on freedom. But black folk, right, and non-white, you know, you know and other, you know what I'm saying, non-white folk cannot be violent at a, for, for a systemic thing. So, so it, it goes back to this notion of reimagining um, history, reimagining who we are, and just kind of um, really kind of rethinking the ways in which we understand history. Thank you so much. Um, we are at time. And as I say, we're, we're going to grab a lot of the, the great knowledge from our uh, panelists and from um, the audience to, to get that together. Um, any final thoughts before we, we head off and say good night for the evening from either of you in terms of um, the day's conversation. Ms. Jones, go first. I'm just, uh, again, appreciative of everyone who took time out of their day to join in. And uh, the fact that you're here means that you care about this and you want to try to get this right for all of our kids. And uh, I'm just happy to uh, join with Dr. Kane to try to be a resource here. And the Pulitzer Center is, of course, an amazing resource and partner in all of this. So let's let's keep working on this together. Um, I want us to look at our journey as, um, and, I, and I want to compare it to exercise, right? For a lot of us, uh, <laughs> we may have uh, gained a few weights. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised I still fit my jacket. But, uh, we, uh, um, but all of us know for us to have gains, whether it's gaining muscle or uh, slimming down and eating right. So, so we have to eat right and we have to really work hard, right? We have to sweat. We have to you know, you know, do all these particular things. We know that we can't make any gains if we get on the treadmill and we walk two miles per hour for 10 minutes, right? That does nothing. But what we've been doing, right, in terms of black history education in, 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 in our country since, since the Civil War is we've been walking two miles per hour for 10 minutes and thinking <laughs> we're making progress, right? So we need to start becoming a little bit more uncomfortable. We need to push ourselves a little more we need to stop talking about this notion of safe space and move to racialized spaces so we can actually get at the crux of the problem, right? Um, so, so I'm so happy to be in conversation with um, you all, and I, 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 I look forward to um, you know pushing uh, the 1619 project and other pro uh, projects out there that um, believes in um, historical equity. Well, thank you both uh, so much today um, for joining us, Nicole Hannah-Jones and Dr. LeGarrette King for today's conversation. We're also very grateful to all of our colleagues at the Pulitzer Center, the entire education team who uh, developed the curricular res resources for the 1619 project and to our producer for today, Holly Pippenberg. Uh, we want to thank our audience too, because we appreciate you joining us today and we are a nonprofit, so if you are able to support our work, we really appreciate that. Please also stay on a few minutes longer to take a brief survey after we've officially closed. As a reminder, our next event is tomorrow. It's Friday, February 26th, when we'll launch an event series on the 1619 Project Law School Initiative. And more events are also planned in March. So please visit our website for those details. And of course, feel free to continue sharing this information with your friends and colleagues. Thank you again and have a good evening. <laughs>